So it is my pleasure to have here today Abrard Ross, uh, better known as Hardy Ross. Uh, thank you, Hardy, for accepting being here. Um, he is perhaps better known from a time dependent density functional theory, but uh, you did many other things. But let's start from the beginning. Um, you studied in Frankfurt. That's right, right, yes. And you studied mathematics and then f switched to physics. Uh, can you tell Correct, us? Correct, yeah. So uh, after the Abitur, um, one has to decide for something, and I decided for mathematics. It's not that I disliked physics, but uh, in, in high school I had the feeling that I don't really understand what's going on in physics, and so I decided for math. And uh, a special feature of the uh, math program at Frankfurt University is that you have to take uh, theoretical physics classes, a significant number of them. And uh, um, I liked those classes so much that I ultimately switched to physics. So that's the story. Um, I still did my uh, four diploma, so that's uh, in the traditional German system, the, the first comprehensive exam. Um, in mathematics, and uh, after that I switched to physics. And that's where you met uh, Reinhard Reitzler. Yes, so it was Reinhard Reitzler who taught those theoretical physics classes that uh, uh, made me like this topic. And one can say it was really Reiner who, who seduced me to, to look into theoretical physics more seriously. and. Uh, Without him, I'd probably be a mathematician today. <laughs> and so this was a very important influence. And then later I, I wrote my diploma thesis with him and also then even later the, the PhD thesis. Now let's, let's then talk about the, the, your diploma thesis. Mm -hmm. It was about Thomas Fermi theory applied to molecules. Right. Uh, right, so that was my first contact with DFT in the widest sense. So, uh, Thomas Fermi is a, is a version of DFT, or a particular approximation, one could say. But it was already at that time well known that uh, if you want to describe molecules with uh, Thomas Fermi theory, it's not particularly good, actually it's very bad. So our idea at the time was to use the Thomas Fermi equations to get an approximate effective potential and then use this effective potential in the one body Schrodinger equation, the equation that is now known as cohn sham equation, and for a molecule um, at each internuclear separation solve the Thomas Fermi equation. That was my diploma mm -hmm. thesis. And from that diploma thesis came your first article in That's 1976. Right. That's right, yes. Thomas Fermi potentials for quasi-molecular collision processes. Yes. So there's an aspect that uh, nowadays is um, basically forgotten. I do remember that the major part of my diploma thesis was to write a code that would plot the Thomas Fermi potential for a molecule. These plots are in this paper, in fact. <laughs> so this was not so easy and was a major fraction <laughs> of my <laughs> scientific work to write uh, this code. Mm. Nowadays it's all trivial, these, these things, but uh, um, yeah. Um, so Rainer Dreisler was one of the few persons in the world at that time that was working on DFT. It was still a, uh, a theory in its infancy, in a way. Yes, yes. How, yes. how was it to work with him? How was the environment in the group of Frankfurt? He was a nuclear physicist, right, in the, at, at, at the beginning. Yes, he, he was a nuclear physicist. In fact, I was the first of his students who would not work on nuclear physics. So together with him, we learned DFT mm -hmm. and the hohenberg cohn theorem and uh, Thomas Fermi and all these things. Yes. So he was uh, a person who always insisted on the deepest understanding possible. And uh, this is um, uh, nowadays not uh, so fashionable anymore, I would say. 
uh, writing many papers or so was not important for him. Deepest understanding possible. That was the crucial uh, uh, guideline, let's say. And that's something that I appreciated and that definitely I adopted for myself as well. And with him, then, you also did your PhD thesis, now on a different topic. Yes. So, relativistic systems now. Yes, so it was still DFT, but um, um, it was on the, what nowadays is known, gradient functionals or gradient expansions. There was a particular method at that time uh, as, as one way of constructing approximate functionals. This is the Kirschnitz uh, gradient expansion. And uh, in the first step, we deduced the uh, lowest order gradient term of the exchange energy, reproducing the, the sham result from before, but mm -hmm. with a different method. And um, then uh, the idea was to deduce a gradient functional for the non-interacting kinetic energy but for relativistic systems on the basis of the Dirac equation. And um, this turned out to be exceedingly difficult for a reason that one might not expect at first. Uh, the, the standard gradient expansion is essentially an expansion in powers of h-bar. And uh, for non-relativistic system, it truncates. So you have two terms or three, and those are the lowest orders, and then you go to the next orders. But uh, uh, due to the fact that the Dirac equation is a, is a first order differential equation, mm -hmm. you actually get in lowest order and second order in h-bar infinitely many terms that you have to resum. And that was a major difficulty. And, uh, but. Uh, yeah, that was my PhD <laughs> thesis. Yeah, it was certainly not. It's easier said than done, than right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. this work was then published in uh, in uh, eighty one mm -hmm. mm -hmm. with uh, with uh, with Reiner Dreitzler. Right. Exactly. So okay. uh, you finished your PhD and you still remained <coughs> in Frankfurt for a few That's years. That's right. Yes. And uh, uh, a new diploma student arrived, Erich Runge. Yes, yes. And with, uh, with him, then, you started uh, to work on time-dependent test functional theory, on time-dependent problems. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, it was, first of all, a, a, a very lucky coincidence that uh, Erich Runge uh, joined my office. So I had been with a different a uh, co-worker uh, uh, been in that office for a number of years, but this other co-worker who uh, uh, also simult simultaneously to me uh, finished his PhD thesis, he moved to Canada. And um, um, so Erich Runge came to this office, an absolutely brilliant young diploma student. And uh, so we talked about everything Gott und die Welt, as we say in German. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now, uh, th there's one important aspect that I, I like to emphasize that is in a way obvious, but all of us, I believe, are to a good extent uh, the, the product of, of our environment. So the, what I mean by that is the, the, the kind of problems that you think about that is in your mind, is uh, to a good extent influenced by what's going on around you. So at the time, uh, uh, science pretty much everywhere in the world and also in Germany was dominated by nuclear physics. And uh, so questions like uh, creating heavy nuclei, short-lived nuclei, but heavier than the ones that you see in the, in the standard periodic table. And there were calculations at the time that they uh, should exist as a valley of stability where further out there should be some stable nuclei. And um, people were trying to find those by shooting two uranium nuclei onto each other. And then there's for a short time a compound nucleus which then decays 
and uh, the idea was that, that one of these decay products would then be uh, one of those uh, heavy nuclei. So in these collision processes there's clearly also electrons around and the particularly interesting question at the time uh, was cases where the combined Coulomb field of the two nuclei would exceed mc squared and if in one of the, the atoms you had a hole in the k-shell this would then dive in the negative continuum of the Dirac equation and in this simplified uh, picture you would expect that uh, then positrons could be measured that uh, should form by this hole diving in the negative continuum. So this was what at the time was fashionable, nuclear physics on one side, positron production in colliding nuclei, but it was everything that was relevant in the minds of people were scattering processes. So the natural thing then is to think, well, if electrons are around, and not just one electron, but many electrons, they kind of screen each other and uh, so we knew at the time, through my diploma thesis mm -hmm. and PhD <laughs> thesis, that, um, <clears throat> that there's DFT around. But it's not a ground state situation, but instead it's, it's a scattering process. Mm -hmm. A time dependent and process. So, yeah. and, and the natural description is to have a, a classical trajectory for the nuclei, which then form a time dependent external potential for, for the electrons. So it was uh, a, a natural thing. To, to think about. And uh, in that sense, it's really born out of the uh, uh, environment <coughs> and the kind of questions that were considered mm -hmm. interesting at the time. We never thought about linear response. Right? So linear response theories is, is, is uh, uh, it never happens in this <laughs> collision <laughs> process. <laughs> so it was not a natural thing for us to think about. Um, and uh, how about the proof? Because the, contrary to, to essentially all other DFTs that are based on the, on the minimum principle, mm. uh, in, time dependent, in the time-dependent case you cannot use this minimum right. principle, right. so the proof is very, very different. Uh, the, the, the proof of the, what's called now the hohenberg gross theorem is really very different from the hohenberg theorem. So how did it come, the idea yeah. on how to prove this one-to-one this -one correspondence? Yeah, so as I said, uh, there was this uh, bright uh, person in the same office, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> having uh, uh, <clears throat> people in close contact is, is, is very important for this. So we discussed, we discussed every day, and every day things that are interesting, DFT, scattering, so it, it kind of evolved in a natural way. Now, since you're asking the, uh, about the proof, it became quite clear that uh, you, you cannot use um, variational principles in the, in the usual form, like in, in ground state DFT. So, what could the proof be based on? Basically, just the, the time-dependent Schrödinger mm -hmm. equation. What, what else could it be? Right? <laughs> And uh, this is how it evolved, and it was really a true and, and, and wonderful collaboration. So one step induced the next one until we finally had it. Mm -hmm. And it led to this famous physical review letters of 1984, density right. functional theory for time-dependent systems. Right. <laughs> the beginning of, uh, of TDDFT. Yeah. Yeah. So m around this time there were two very important conferences in DFT or meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first was uh, in, in Portugal, in Alcubierre, in 1983, a NATO conference, and then in Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. a long meeting. Um, the, the participants in, this, in these conferences, we, we, we know basically the name of all of them. They all became <laughs> important persons right, in the field, right. uh, like in, in Alcubierre, there were uh, Walter Kohn, uh, Levy, Perdue, Lieb. Reitzter, Parr, Jagopal, Stoll, Savin, Altblatt, von Barth, <laughs> Norton Lang, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. This was, these two conferences were kind of the forming of a, of a community. In uh, yes, so one can say that. Yeah. What What yeah. were your impressions? Do you re recall the, this conference? The, the, the 
Do you recall the environment? Uh, how, how was it? Yeah, it was extremely lively. It, uh, you, you got the feeling that there's some uh, beginning of, of something. Nobody, at least I, and also certainly not Walter Cohn, would guess at that time that uh, DFT would uh, grow to this uh, magnificent, magnificent power that it has now. <laughs> but uh, um, it was clearly a, a, a kind of a pioneer spirit at the time, I, I would say, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where you met Walter Cohn? That's right. Yeah, so this meeting in Portugal, in Alcabideshi, was exceedingly important for my personal uh, career. Um, I gave three lectures there. Um, two were essentially my, my uh, PhD thesis, uh, so this gradient expansion, and one of them, that uh, work that I just had finished with, with Erich Runge on, on what is now known as the runge gross theorem. And um, so I presented this work, and this uh, got Walter Cohn uh, so interested that he invited me to work with him as a postdoc. So, and uh, this ultimately led me to move to Santa Barbara where then, in the end, I stayed for six years. And uh, it was the beginning of a, of a lifelong friendship with Walter Cohn, I can say. And uh, so it was super important uh, to have, for me as a young postdoc, mm -hmm. it was, I think, three years after my PhD, uh, to, to present this. And, um, yeah, it, I should also... Uh, mentioned, although um, uh, this, my presentation triggered Walter's interest in, in DDDFT, it uh, definitely didn't mean that he believed it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, after I arrived, uh, very much to my disappointment, I had to realize that <laughs> this just triggered his interest. Well, it, took, <laughs> it took me another two years to convince him that it's actually proper and <laughs> correct and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in, in, in the first paper that uh, Walter and I wrote together, which is also on, on DFT but on the linear response version, uh, is uh, it uh, kind of uh, avoids uh, referring to the runge gross theorem mm -hmm. <laughs> because it, it says something like referring to the spirit of <laughs> DFT or <laughs> some, some vague remark because at that time he was not yet convinced that it's correct. Uh -huh. So that's that's the reason. But in the end I succeeded. <laughs> yeah. Before discussing the, the your time in Santa Barbara, I would like to, to go back to your to, to your years in Frankfurt and to the to the book of many particle theory that you mm -hmm. that you wrote with Erich Wunge. Um, you were very young at the time and uh, Erich Wunge was even younger. Uh, from now, nowadays standards, it's quite uh, amazing that you wrote an, a book. Um, can you tell the story of uh, how this, this book came up? Yeah, basically, I felt that I should learn many body theory, uh, Feynman diagrammatics, better than I knew it at the time. And uh, so the best way, as we all know, is to teach a course. On <laughs> on the topic that you want to learn. So that's what I did. It was uh, many body theory, a three semester course. Mm -hmm. And um, Erich Runge was among the students who took the course and he prepared some, some kind of lecture notes for it. And after, after the end of this course, he gave those to me and said what I think about and I, I read them and I then we discussed it and uh, uh, we felt that this is uh, maybe a good uh, basis for, for a book. And uh, this is uh, then that led to this uh, yes. first book. So first there was the German edition yes, in yes. German and uh, mm -hmm. some time later the book was translated to English mm -hmm. and published. Uh, but you were already in Santa Barbara at that time, right? Yes, yes. So the uh, 
English translation was done by Ulla Heinonen, who was uh, my office mate for a while in Santa Barbara. And uh, so the book in Germany was, was uh, successful and I tried to translate it myself. But I realized I, I, I'm too perfectionist for that, so it took me ages, the first uh, three pages, so in the end I decided, no, uh, maybe somebody else should do that. And um, um, I told uh, um, Ulle, who was sitting in, in the same office <laughs> as myself, uh, uh, this story that I uh, have this book in German and it turned out uh, that he speaks German very well and he kind of offered to translate it to English. Uh, and then um, he added uh, a sizable chapter at the end of the book on Landau theory of Fermi liquids, which was his, uh, his expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he became a co-author on the, on the English edition as well. Uh, if I remember well, there's also a funny story with the page proofs or uh, some corrections that disappeared. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or a sad story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was uh, still in the early days of, of email, one could say. Right? I'm not sure when this exactly started, email. It was around early 80s, I believe. And um, so towards the end of uh, the the polishing of the of the english version um, there was a, a set of corrections many many corrections that uh, erich and myself had uh, iterated and then this was sent to ule uh, but he never got it somehow so in the english version there's uh, a lot of mistakes typos and so on <laughs> So if you are in doubt uh, ever, <laughs> then go back to the German version <laughs> and there you find the right... That was done before email, right? So <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> It was not before really, but it was not so perfect yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's the, the story of, of that book. Yeah. So then you moved to Santa Barbara, where you stayed for six years with uh, Walter Kohn. Yes. So at first I had a, a NATO fellowship, which was a very nice thing. Uh, and then I was regular postdoc of Walter Cohn, funded from his uh, uh, NSF grant. And um, then after these first two years, I got uh, a Heisenberg fellowship mm -hmm. from the DFG, which I then asked for uh, using it in, in the United States, and that was possible. And that funded another four years. Mm -hmm. So before discussing some of the scientific outcomes of those, of those six years, maybe, maybe can, can you tell us a few words how it was to work with, uh, with Walter Kohn? Yes. Uh, so uh, I, a very specific feature of the way uh, Walter was doing science um, was, yeah, one could call it deductionism taken to the extreme. So let me, let me explain. It was um, when you talk to him about uh, a serious topic, he would explain. Explain the most obvious things. <laughs> so I would ask myself, why is he explaining this to me? It's, it's obvious. <laughs> and uh, okay, so sometimes he would ask if, if you would agree, and uh, I said yes. And um, and sometimes uh, you'd give uh, remarks of your own. Then he uh, proceeded and uh, to the next step, and again he would tell things that. Uh, following from the first step, but uh, totally obvious. Uh, it's kind of trivial. <laughs> so, yes, I would agree again. <laughs> and, and, and this kept, kept going for an hour or two. But then, after two hours, you realize you reach a point that in the beginning you would never dream of. So this, this was Walter Cohn. So really, deductionism 
step by step logical thinking um, what the consequences of a certain hypothesis ultimately mm -hmm. leads to. Uh, and uh, also, um, maybe related to this, uh, uh, was that, that uh, when Walter would explain something, he would speak extremely slowly. So, whenever I came back to Santa Barbara later, it, it was kind of a shock. Uh, that is <laughs> so slowly that uh, after a while you get used to it and that's the way it is. <laughs> but <laughs> that was a, a feature that is of course very much appreciated by myself and, and his other students and co-workers. I mean, you can really follow right, what, what your boss uh, mm -hmm. means and <laughs> wants from you. Um, um, he also was a, a very political person. So he, um, at that time, uh, when I started in Santa Barbara, there was a political discussion on what was known as uh, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, where the idea was uh, to, to create some protective shield of the United States with uh, with lasers, and uh, and uh, Walter Cohn strongly opposed it, and uh, he felt it's technically not feasible, uh, and uh, had the feeling, probably correctly, <laughs> that this was mainly a trick of some of the the experimental colleagues to uh, uh, get a lot of money for their own <laughs> research, but <laughs> with very little military uh, uh, use. So this was one of the things and uh, that he was uh, uh, fighting against. Another thing that uh, was a lifelong struggle, uh, uh, that he opposed the fact that the uh, weapons labs uh, are formally part of the University of California. So he felt uh, that uh, these institutions, which were really designed to create uh, nuclear weapons, basically, uh, uh, should not be part of a university, should not have this kind of academic appearance, which they were really not right? mm -hmm. <laughs> in practice. So uh, that uh, was among many other political initiatives that uh, I'm remembering now. And uh, he uh, was frequently invited to uh, TV shows, right, and uh, um, talk shows, as one would call it today. <laughs> and uh, clearly, wh whenever I watched this, I, I had the feeling that uh, he would certainly lose the argument, because he would explain the way he would always explain, very slowly, very precise in his choice of, of words. But, well, in, in politics, this is not so much appreciated, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> you would kind of uh, yeah, get the wrong impression uh, when you watch the TV show. Um, yeah, so that was, that was like uh, working with him. Of course, there was also the aspect that he was really in solid-state physics, one of the creators of that whole mm -hmm. field, and so it was kind of overwhelming and uh, intimidating the, the, the knowledge that uh, he, mm -hmm. he would have. But uh, I learned a lot, so, so that was good. Uh, I, I remember you telling me a story when you arrived in Santa Barbara involving some poisonous <laughs> flowers. Oh, God, yes, yes. Would you like to share it with us? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so this was the first time I was invited to uh, Walter's home. So it was just one or two months after I arrived. And um, um, so on that day in, in the morning, I did a hike in the uh, Santa Barbara foothills. This is actually an area which is among my favorite places on earth. It's, it's very nice to do hikes there. and. Um, so I felt, well, maybe I should bring something like a bouquet to Mrs. Cohn and, uh, well, why not find some self-picked flowers? <laughs> and it was fall, so it was October or November, 
So the, the, the colors of fall, uh, yellow and red, which was beautiful. And um, I found this plant, uh, very beautiful, looked a bit <laughs> like ivy. <laughs> and I picked some of those and some other flowers as well and made a nice bouquet for Mrs. Cohn. So I arrived at his home later on that day and uh, bringing this uh, bouquet. <laughs> And I'll never forget this uh, split second of desperation <laughs> in, in Walter Cohn's uh, eyes. And then, uh, so, so he grabbed the, <laughs> the bouquet and said, excuse me for a moment. <laughs> and, and then this bouquet disappeared, <laughs> never to be seen again. And, <laughs> and then he explained uh, about uh, the plants of the Santa Barbara foothills, including the fact that this is uh, actually a plant uh, that is poisonous and uh, causes very strong allergic reactions among 35% of uh, <laughs> Americans. <laughs> and and uh, his wife, and he knew that, was extremely allergic to it. So it would have been actually really dangerous for her. <laughs> but uh, so like having to go to hospital. And uh, so <laughs> luckily he spotted it <laughs> right away. <laughs> so, but there's a second part of this story, which was maybe uh, 10 years later. Uh, I was, so at that time I was already uh, working in Germany again. But uh, I, I was in Santa Barbara and there was a, um, a meeting at the, at the institute and um, I took a taxi there. And it turned out that the taxi driver uh, had some relation to physics. I'm not sure if he had uh, children or other people in his family who, who were knowledgeable about physics, but he, he kind of knew that the ITP where I was going, that this was physics. And, and then he says, you know, there was this story, uh, a, a scientist from Europe who, uh, uh, believe it, uh, uh, brought this poison uh, ivy <laughs> to Mrs. Cohen. <laughs> so he told me that story <laughs> years later. <laughs> so, and, uh, and then I told him, yes, that was me. <laughs> so. That was the second part of this. Uh, so now I know the plants of, <laughs> <laughs> of the Santa Barbara foothills very well. Yeah. These uh, uh, meetings, in fact, or uh, gatherings on, uh, 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 in Walter Cohn's home, they were kind of legendary, one could say. It was typically 10 people or so that he would uh, invite, so some, fraction of those would be members of his group, um, but then also visitors or other faculty members. And um, it was always extremely nice, very lively discussions. And um, he would uh, typically in the morning of that day uh, buy some fresh fish at the Santa Barbara fish market and he would uh, then prepare this for the guests on, on his grill on the terrace. And this terrace, you had a view on the town of Santa Barbara, so it was a really very special place. And this is remembered by the whole community, so it's, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let us maybe now discuss the scientific uh, work also in Santa Barbara. You worked with Walter in time-dependent distance functional theory, and then there were a few other topics that uh, that were started in those six years. Yep. Yeah. So the first topic uh, was on time-dependent density functional theory. Walter asked me to work out the linear response version of TDDFT. And uh, from what I said before, clearly I had no idea about what linear response theory was. <laughs> and so that was the first thing that I learned in Santa Barbara. And from this then we deduced the first uh, functional, approximate functional for the exchange correlation kernel and its frequency dependence. 
Mm -hmm. And then uh, came Ensemble BFT. Yes, that's right. Uh, now with, uh, with uh, Luis Oliveira that arrived in the meanwhile in Santa Barbara. Yes. So um, after maybe one or two years uh, uh, of staying in Santa Barbara, then um, uh, Luis Oliveira from, from São Carlos in Brazil arrived and uh, uh, he shared the office with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> once again, this very important aspect. Actually, do you know this, this anecdote that uh, BCS theory came into existence in this form? So they had a, a shortage of offices at Cornell mm -hmm. uh, where uh, John Bardeen was working at the time and, um, and uh, so these young postdocs, uh, Cooper and Schrieffer, mm -hmm. shared the office with Bardeen. So one, one office, all three, and this ultimately led to the BCS theory. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> these, these things are important. So we should make common offices. That's <laughs> <laughs> yes, so this is a, 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 an argument that I always used uh, to, to emphasize that it's not so bad, after all, <laughs> to have cramped offices <laughs> with many people. It can lead to something good. So in any case, so uh, Luis arrived and uh, we became uh, very, very good friends until today. And uh, so uh, the next topic that we then uh, worked on was Ensemble DFT. This was uh, Walter's suggestion. So at the time, there was um, already an Ensemble DFT uh, existing, uh, developed by Andreas Teofilo. Um, this was a somewhat, it, it was a, a pioneering in, 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 in this field, started with, with Teofilo's work but it worked with so-called equi ensembles, which is a kind of a special case. Um, now, Walter was uh, a champion in statistical mechanics, so he uh, kind of tried to draw connections between the Theophilo work, which was an equi ensemble, so all states in the ensemble had the same weight, and uh, the thermal ensemble, where you have the usual Boltzmann weights. And um, we should think about, that was his suggestion, how these things hang together. And maybe one could deduce something like a, a more general ensemble DFT, where the weights are not all the same. And uh, this then gave uh, rise to these uh, three papers. Mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, Luis Oliveira and, uh, and Walter Cohn. Mm -hmm. And then came uh, density function theory for superconductors, also with Luis Oliveira and Walter Cohn. Yes. So this was definitely triggered by the experimental discovery of the cuprate superconductors, which mm -hmm. was at that time. So this was, uh, as you know, a, a big revolution. In the whole field. In the whole field, in the whole field of condensed matter physics, one can, one can say. And uh, almost every condensed matter theorist <laughs> felt uh, compelled to uh, understand the mechanism and to <laughs> work in one way or another on, on this. And this really also triggered us to think about something like a DFT for superconductors. So that gave rise to, to this paper, which is the formal framework, one can say, on the DFT for superconductors. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find the DFT for superconductors a, a very interesting case because it really combines many of the difficulties of many density functional theories all at the same time. You have uh, multi-component formalism, you have yeah. temperature, you have many body physics to through the Schumpfschulter equation to derive functionals. It's uh, uh, it really combines all these complicated aspects. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes. And at this time, this was a purely electronic theory, so yes. it's really yes. thought for uh, the high TCs. Yes, that that's what was it 
what it was meant for. So there were no nuclei, no nuclear motion. It was just fixed nuclei in the in the born Oppenheimer framework. Nuclear motion came later. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you say that, that the DFT for superconductors kind of combines all the all the complications that the many body theory can offer, <laughs> the many body field can offer. That's certainly true, but as opposed to the purely electronic theory, there's also one aspect that makes it easier, namely it has a small parameter. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's the electronic over nuclear mass ratio, which ultimately tells you what the dominant diagram is. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is migdal eliasberg theory, and that uh, uh, makes many things a lot easier, and ultimately led to the fact that with good functionals, uh, that good functionals are much easier to construct. Namely, you take the dominant diagram, that's mm -hmm. it. And you you are able uh, to predict critical temperatures from the DFT for superconductors for the phonon-driven mechanism, uh, a feature that in magnetism has never been achieved, where you, in the sense of just doing DFT at finite temperature, calculate the Curie temperature or, or the Neel temperature, that's still extremely hard. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, in, in magnetism, there is no small parameter, right? while, while for the superconductivity case there is. So this makes life easier, in a sense. <laughs> yeah. But I think this is also a good example of the time and effort that developing such theories takes. So uh, the, the, the original paper, the Oliver grossen Korn, is from 1988. Right. The, the first functionals for... for uh, uh, including the electron phonon coupling, are from uh, um, 2005. Mm -hmm. And the newest functionals that you refer to that are very precise are from a couple of years ago. That's right. Yeah. So uh, it's... Uh, yeah, that's the typical time scale in, in the construction. 40 years, uh, yeah. 35 years of development. That's right. right. To, uh, it's the same time scale as in ordinary DFT, if you think about it. Right. The theorems were in, in 64 or 65, mm -hmm. and then the first uh, functionals of which one could say they are, uh, were accepted as being good enough to describe chemistry were in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So again, that's uh, yeah. 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> yeah. um, going um, back to those, to those uh, end uh, of the 80s, um, in 1990 you publish your, your second book with uh, Rainer Dreitzler. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the book that I think is quite famous by now on density functional theory. But this was not a course of uh, lecture no, notes. No. Actually I assume that no, there was at this time no course on density functional theory in the whole world. Uh, probably, uh, probably. Yes, yeah. So where does this come from? The, the so this was uh, uh, a commission to write a review article um, that we started, I think, 84. Mm -hmm. So in the year where I actually left for Santa Barbara, but we kept working on, on this on and off. Uh, so we started writing this review article the major part of it was uh, written before I left, in fact. And, but it grew longer and longer and longer, and in the end <laughs> we felt uh, maybe it's better to publish it as a book. Mm -hmm. And this is how it came into existence. Yeah. So, um, ten years after the first NATO conference in DFT, in Alcabidesh, there was the second in 1993 in Il Choco in Italy. This time it was co-organized by you and Rainer Dreitzler. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, it was, uh, the, the proceedings were edited in, in memory of, of Mark Hazolt. And uh, now we see kind of the second generation of density functionalists, let's, let's call it, that, uh, that participated, people like uh, Eberhard Engel, uh, 
Bader, Jones, uh, Nor uh, March, Dobson, Vignale, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, do you remember this this conference? What were what was the exciting topic at this time? I think the dominant topic at that time were the GGAs. So mm -hmm. this was the first really successful step beyond the LDA in the first decade, let's say, after, after LDA. People tried uh, what is known as gradient expansions, but it turned out that uh, results with truncated uh, versions, low-order truncated versions of the gradient expansions uh, were worse than the LDA. And it took a while to understand why they were worse, because they violate uh, certain conditions like, like the fact that the integrated exchange hole should be minus mm -hmm. one. And uh, one began to understand that uh, certain certain exact conditions play play a role, like, like this one. This is a particularly important one. And uh, so then the first, uh, what now is called uh, generalized gradient approximations, uh, appeared, uh, a paper by Langreth and Mehl. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this was heavily discussed, and how one should proceed from there, and what uh, the prospects are and what the criteria are that uh, uh, have to be satisfied uh, by these constructions. And uh, so this was the, the dominating topic, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, these were probably the golden years of the development of uh, functionals. Functionals, yes. Uh, it came yes. after yes. the back 88, back, back 88, uh, Jean mm -hmm. Verdieu had already published the PW91. That's right. Yes. And the, the, the thing that I found very interesting in the proceedings of this conference is that we started seeing appearing a lot of applications of, of density functional theory. Mm -hmm. uh, while in the first there were more theoretical considerations and of, of different aspects, here there were already several chapters That's right. with yes. calculations. So the theory started being useful. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. At this time, was it clear that the FT would become such a such an important theory in the in the in theoretical chemistry and physics I, s I think some people at that time would already get the feeling that that this would be a really big thing in the end i think walter Cohn could could feel it at the time mm -hmm. and one thing that nowadays many people uh, will not remember is this um, phase transition one could call it like that, <laughs> that uh, one particular paper, the one by uh, uh, John Popel and co-workers, created um, until this paper appeared in the, in the world of chemistry to use DFT was really considered indecent. Right? No, no proper theoretical chemist would touch DFT. And um, with this one paper, uh, which compares um, Hartree-Fock with some of the, uh, at that time, available functionals, LDA and the, and the Becker mm -hmm. uh, gradient functional, uh, showed that uh, this theory gets for a sizable number of, of molecules, better atomization energies than Hartree Fock at uh, equal or even lower cost, one could argue that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this convinced the chemistry community. I mean, John Popel was, was, uh, was a very uh, important figure in, in the chemistry community. And uh, this one paper turned it around. It, it was really, one, one could watch this. There was this hostility, one could even say, towards uh, DFT in, in the world of chemistry, which changed completely in, in the early 90s and then led to the Nobel Prize in 1998 for Popel and Walter Kohn. Mm -hmm. And um, this, 
second conference in 1993 was in this period where you where this turnaround was happening or had already happened to to some extent and it uh, so it was really right uh, very clearly upward gradient mm -hmm. that you could feel uh, in the development um then uh, in 1990, if I'm not mistaken, you moved to um, to Würzburg. That's right. Yes. Right mm -hmm. to the to the same department where there was Werner Hanke that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. had also worked in uh, density functional theory with uh, with uh, Shaman Schutter. Uh, how do you see this this part of your career the, that you, you become a professor? Uh, you start having your your group, your students. Yes, yes. Um, well, it's like the first time you become professor, you are very happy, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but then, at the same time, there's a lot of teaching, and uh, you realize that your uh, time management is uh, much more complicated than it was before. But okay, uh, I liked it, and. Um, continued in the early 90s then with uh, the, the things that I had done before. On one hand, uh, TDDFT, mm -hmm. uh, in fact the first uh, real-time TDDFT calculation happened during that period. It was calculation by Carsten Ulrich, it was his uh, PhD thesis. To, uh, uh, to calculate the harmonic spectrum, the high harmonic generation mm -hmm. of, um, of um, atoms. And um, then in the mid-90s came also the uh, continuation of the linear response DDDFT, um, uh, the calculation of, of excitation spectra. Yes, there is this famous paper of Peter Silke, Grossman and Gross right, that was right. mm -hmm. one of the first to provide, show in a way that uh, that TDDFT in the adiabatic approximation gave quite reasonable excitation energies and that opened the way to TDDFT becoming standard in some sense in, in, uh, in, in this kind of calculations. Um, there were in this period also some new topics that emerged. For example, the coupled electron nuclei uh, movement. Uh, if I remember well, uh, this started in a in memorable series of uh, coffee seminars that uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> by, Nico, uh, by, uh, by um, Nikitas Gidopoulos, if I remember well, it took eight or nine weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yes. So, and since then you have been quite attracted to this topic. Yeah, so this was um, at first really a continuation of, of TDDFT, one could say, real-time TDDFT. So if you have a time-dependent Schrödinger equation for the electrons, why not treat the nuclei somehow in the same footing? That was uh, a thesis by by... Thomas Kreibich, um, but then uh, Nikitas uh, uh, arrived as a postdoc and he had a different take on, on this uh, coupled electron nuclear problem uh, that uh, we now call the exact factorization. It's really, um, he was the, the pioneer on, on, on this and this has since been one of my uh, favorite topics on and off, but really seriously, maybe for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so this uh, something that maybe electronic structure people uh, don't really appreciate. I realize that especially solid state physicists have no idea what non adiabaticity means <laughs> in a way. Uh, so chemists tend to be much more precise in, in that context. But also for solids it's much harder. And uh, that's um, uh, something that uh, we are still trying to understand better. Uh, this, this miracle, I would say, that uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation 
uh, let's say for the calculation of, of vibrational spectra, works for metals. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't work. Right? <laughs> if you have the simple uh, picture of when Bornot Mahama is valid, uh, but it does work most of the time. Most of the time. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, a situation where, where certainly non adiabaticity is expected to, to have significant effect, but most of the time it doesn't. And uh, so this is something still to be understood better, I believe. And this is uh, my current <laughs> my current hobby, one could say. Yeah. Uh, so a, a very distinct point of working in your group are your coffee seminars that uh, I think everybody that passed through your group will, uh, will cherish. Um, can you please explain us how the idea for these coffee seminars uh, came and, and how did they work? I, I honestly don't remember where the idea comes from. Uh, it, it, it's just my own uh, wish or urge to understand things uh, deeply. So uh, typically if someone gives a talk or a presentation in this coffee seminar, which was our regular group meeting seminars, um, then the, the, the question started after the first line and uh, <laughs> Typically, after one hour, one maybe would proceed to the third line, and <laughs> it was just, uh, I mean, it turns out, which is in fact often the case, that, that uh, the difficulties in, in some development are buried somehow in the first line. So it's, uh, it's something that some group members really hated. <laughs> and some others loved it, <laughs> but for me, personally, the, the, there was no other way. I, I cannot just ignore uh, if something is not really fully understood. So that was the idea, and the, the topics were sometimes related to specific projects that people had, sometimes uh, questions that came from some interesting talk elsewhere or some paper. It was a mix of, of things that people or myself found interesting and, and then we went through this uh, deeply. And uh, yeah, extreme cases was that, was that series eight by, weeks, eight, <laughs> by, eight by weeks. Nikitas, yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, several other examples of, of similar length. Yes, so yeah. Uh, I mean, many of my former group members later told me that this is the one thing that they remember, that, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and that they, at least in retrospect, uh, appreciate it. It was uh, yeah. a very interesting learning tool, let's say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, this is what it was meant to be, really, uh, uh, a teaching ultimately learning mm -hmm. event, teaching and learning event. Yeah. Um, maybe we, we move on now. Uh, from Wolfsburg, you then moved to Berlin in 2000, 2001 mm -hmm. to become a W3 professor in the Freie Universität. Uh, you continue working in all, all these topics, uh, but for me, the, one of the highlights is again uh, superconductors. That's yes. when uh, Finally, there was a working functional for, for, for electron phonon superconductivity in the first applications. And as you once told me, uh, density functional theory, if it's good or bad, depends on the functional, depends, having a working functional or not. So what, what are your thoughts about, about this? What were the challenges and the, and the, and the, and the difficulties? To, to arrive at this, at this step 20 years after the first paper on uh, density functional theory for superconductors. Yeah, so there was one functional in the, in the 90s which uh, attempted to do what, if you grow up in the density functional world, is the natural thing to try, namely to develop a functional on the basis of the uniform electron gas, which then leads to an LDA. And this was the first thing we did, uh, still in the spirit of finding superconductivity 
for uh, a, a purely electronic mechanism, so no phonons, that was the first functionale, and LDA for superconductors. So we evaluated uh, uh, within some RPA, anomalous RPA um, context, the correlation energy of the superconducting uniform electron gas. And um, was not much used. It led to the knowledge that um, RPA in or an anomalous RPA likes to be superconducting, so it, it lowers the, the total energy, so increases the, um, the condensation energy. But in practice, it's not really, the cube rates are not really uniform. <laughs> so it's not, uh, uh, not used so far, but who knows? It's not so clear. Ultimately, maybe if one ever gets uh, to an understanding of the purely electronic mechanisms that are present in, in the cube rates, um, uh, this might still be of relevance. But then, since you mentioned the uh, the early 2000s in Berlin, and this was largely your work. <laughs> well, not only. <laughs> and uh, so if you have electrons and phonons, the natural thing is to look at uh, the diagrams, uh, of which by Migdal's theorem one knows are the dominant diagrams. And uh, But this is diagrammatics, so you want to do DFT and then there was this uh, method by Sham and Schlüter, which transforms any given approximation for a self-energy into a, uh, a functional or a potential to be used in the cone charm equations. So it required a superconducting generalization of the Sham Schlüter equation, which was your work in, in your thesis. And this then ultimately led to the first uh, really usable and useful approximation in, in this context of DFT for superconductors, but for phonon-driven superconductors. And this turned out to be quite successful. One could predict really fully ab initio, no fudge factors, no mu star, uh, uh, critical temperatures of phonon-driven superconductors. And uh, it had, however, one uh, little detail that uh, ultimately required improvement, and that was the fact that, strictly speaking, Migdal's theorem was not satisfied. One had to address the uh, electron propagator still fully uh, to, to satisfy Migdal's theorem completely. It's the same diagram, but not with the cone sham propagator, but with the full propagator. And um, this is then the most recent functional that uh, appeared uh, two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And at this time, there was also this very important collaboration, in my view, with Sandro Masida. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, this was a wonderful uh, uh, collaboration between Sandro. He had uh, uh, heard a talk that I gave on superconducting DFT. Uh, it had always been kind of his interest uh, to, to deal somehow with superconductors. And he, he uh, after my talk, came to me and, and said, uh, I know exactly what to do, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, he had some interesting ideas of making this uh, first functional better. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and this ultimately became the first real proper predictions of critical temperatures. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, members, PhD students of uh, Sandro became postdocs in my group and vice versa. So it was a real uh, uh, ongoing exchange for, for many years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you left Berlin then in um, in 2009 you were director of the max planck in halle mm -hmm. and uh, and now more recently you are in the in the hebrew university in jerusalem 
In the meanwhile, you, you were in a series of prizes, the Bernie Alder Prize from SECAM, now you have an ERC advanced, advanced grant. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you still have, you're still working on all these topics. So what, what is the thing that interests you the most? What do you think you're going to work in the future? So one of the, the big mysteries for me is uh, uh, how to treat for solids uh, non-adiabatic effects. So when I talk about non-adiabatic effects, I, I mean effects where more than one von Oppenheimer potential energy surface is involved. Um, so this is uh, uh, to be distinguished clearly between uh, um, on one hand, non-adiabatic effects, and on the other hand, unharmonic effects. You can have unharmonicities also with one single born Oppenheimer surface. It's just that you don't have a parabola, but uh, some other shape. That's unharmonicities. So this is not what I'm talking about. If you, you truly uh, somehow take into account the effect of other born Oppenheimer surfaces, which are always there, clearly. Um, this is something that, in my view, is not well understood and uh, 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 this methodology that we developed, especially in Halle, over the last 10 years, which is known as um, exact factorization, I believe will ultimately give you a way of treating uh, non-adiabatic effects in the same way as you usually uh, do the adiabatic approximation because the equations are somehow analogous so you can do the same things. But for solids it's always much harder mm -hmm. and uh, it will require some kind of envelope approximation probably to, to really capture the fact that you have dense, a dense set of surfaces uh, in, a, in a solid and we, we don't really know yet uh, how to do it in practice, but mm -hmm. that's what we work on. So that's one of the challenges. The, the other challenge that I would really like to follow further is to find better functionals for magnetism. Mm -hmm. So this uh, is, is uh, for many people at, at first a surprising fact that uh, at finite temperature the DFT for superconductors works much better than the DFT for magnetism. So you are not able really to predict from finite temperature DFT alone critical temperatures of, of magnets, Curie temperatures or Neel temperatures. And um, this is something that um, I would like to continue working on. It's, um, so there's no small parameter, that's why it's harder than superconductivity. But uh, there's, there's one indication that uh, uh, during the time in Halle, uh, we found that uh, one, one functionnel that uh, is, we call it source-free functionnel, so this mm -hmm. rests on an exact feature of spin DFT, namely that the exchange correlation magnetic field in the non-collinear cone sham equations, non-collinear spin dependent cone sham equations, uh, should be uh, a curl of something, um, while all normal approximations, LDA, GGAs, essentially anything, cannot be written as a curl of something. And uh, we found uh, for a number of systems that uh, fixing this problem miraculously uh, repairs all kinds of difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really fully understood how come, mm -hmm. but uh, it, that's what we empirically find. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is something that I, I want to continue further and ultimately also at, at finite temperature. Mm -hmm. to, to make progress on, on this front. Yeah. And maybe now to conclude, uh, a more general question. 
we all know the past of DFT, we know the present, we know it's still growing exponentially, um, which is maybe surprising because already of the, the, the incredible size that DFT has. So how do you see the future of DFT? What do you think will happen in the next uh, 10, 20, 50 years? Well, it's uh, to be expected that, that the functionals will get better. It's uh, inevitable. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's not so much that I believe that DFT or TDDFT will catch up, in a sense, with wave function methods. It's quite clear that wave function methods will always be more accurate. But um, the scaling with the particle number will always be better for DFT. So there's always uh, the, the realm of larger and therefore more interesting systems mm -hmm. where DFT will, will give increasingly better answers. So this is what I expect. And this will continue in this way. Mm -hmm. So you still see a bright future for DFT? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, Hardy, thank you very much. My pleasure, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>